Today I'm going to talk to you about a good way to expand your poems. And we're going to talk about two different things. One, we're going to talk about what I call layering, as if we were making a layered cake and just kept adding things to it. But officially, grammatically, it's called using a positives. And we're going to talk about the cumulative sentence, which is the sentence you will see, 70% of the sentences you see in published fiction and poetry are cumulative sentences. Okay, so we're going to talk about those two things. And the reason we're talking about that is because I want you to be able to expand your writing, your poems, and your fiction, and to add vivid details without having to just throw in adjectives. Okay, so I want you to think about, have any of you read the book, uh, Grapes of Wrath, by John Steinbeck, or seen the movie? Nope. Wow. Okay. <laughs> One and a half people. Okay. So <laughs> there's a scene in that, in the book and in the movie. Uh, somewhere like on Highway uh, Route 66, in which this guy walks into a diner with his two sons. Okay, this is the Great Depression. This is the Dust Bowl, Oklahoma. Okay, they're, they're very impoverished. He walks in, he asks to buy a loaf of bread uh, for a dime. And the waitress sort of scoffs at him and says, no, you actually have at least 15 cents. Because the loaf of bread costs 15 cents. And the cook says, just go ahead and sell them the bread. And in the meantime, his two little boys look like skinny, tattered little boys are standing at the candy case and just staring at it with their mouths open and wide-eyed. And the woman comes out with a loaf of bread and the man says, no, you just cut off, cut off five cents worth because I only have a dime and I only want to pay you what I have. I only want to get what I have money for. Okay? And then he reaches into his little change purse and he pulls out a dime and he sees a penny. And he, and he, he starts to drop it back into his change purse and he looks over at his two sons and he, and he pulls it out. And he walks over there, and he says to the waitress, and he points at the, uh, the candy canes, the long candy canes, and he says, is, is them penny cake? And, you know, you know we know, it, we don't, John Stomach does not tell us, but we know he's pointing at those long ones because he can break it in half and give each child half of one, as opposed to the little round gumballs and whatnot. And the waitress goes over there and, and says, which ones? And he points at them stripy ones. And without telling us, John Steinbeck is also telling us that candy is a very unusual thing in this day and time. And if you've read your books from the 1800s, like how excited the children got when they got a, a one candy cane in their stocking at Christmas time, one candy cane and one penny, and they were like the most excited people in the world. Okay, so candy was very rare. He's telling us that. But he's giving us all these vivid details. The children standing there with their mouths open and their eyes wide, and their, their bodies are rigid. And the, the man just looks exhausted, and the woman says, no, those are two for a penny candy. So each child got one little piece of candy, and they leave, and the trucker, Bill, is sitting at the counter, and he says, those weren't penny candy. And the lecturer says, what's it to you? And the trucker says, those were a nickel each candy. And then he puts down a 50 cent piece and walks out, and the other trucker sitting beside him puts down a 50 cent piece and walks out, and the waitress yells at, wait, you got change. And the trucker turns around and says, go to hell. <laughs> uh, so for one thing, you got great dialogue, right? Nobody says what you expect them to say. You know, they're not trying to communicate, OK? Uh, the other thing, you have a show of human dignity, people helping each other without any expectation of anything in return. But the other thing you have is vivid, vivid detail. And this is what you want in your poetry and in your short stories and your fiction. OK, because you are, as I've said, making a movie for the reader. Okay, so one way, you know, you, uh, the automatic thing we do when we want to add details is pop in an adjective in front of a noun. What we need to learn how to do is change up the rhythm of the poem, change up the rhythm in our short stories, in our, in our fiction, and use other types of grammatical, grammatical moves to add details. So today we're going to talk about uh, positives, okay, how to layer a noun, a verb, an adjective to make it more detailed and add a different rhythm and then cumulative sentences, as I've already said. Um, okay, because thinking about your sentence, thinking about your words, that's how you write poetry and short story, right? They're not ideas, they're words. They're, they're words put together to form sentences, to form paragraphs or stanzas, okay? And it's a great, sentences are so important that there are craft books written on just the sentence, entire craft books. And like something like Ursula K. Le Guin's Stirring the Craft has an entire chapter on just the sentence. All right, so layering, okay, basically you're taking the, the noun and you're adding the adjective after it. So instead of, um, instead of, for example, he, 
I'm going to try to look for an example over here, but let's just use this one here. James Kimball, one of my favorite poets, right? All right. He uses a very simple noun and a positive to give further detail to his backyard, right? So the first sentence of the poem, holiness, is the paint has flaked off the warped boards and shutters of the old house we lived in. And behind the backyard, bamboo and bare grass, the oyster shell road winds to the cemetery and the headlights glint on the granite stones. Now notice, the paint has flaked off the warped boards. Adjective, noun. I always fail in ninth grade English, but I do know adjectives and nouns. That's so easy, right? We all got that. <laughs> the paint has flaked off the warped boards. Adjective, noun. And shutters of the old house. Adjective, noun. We lived in. And behind the backyard, Bamboo and bare grass. Noun, adjective, adjective. Boom. That's layering. That's a positive. See how easy that was? He could just as easily have said, the paint has flaked off the worked boards and shutters of the old house we lived in, and behind the bamboo and bare grass backyard, the oyster shell road, adjective noun, winds to the cemetery, and the headlights glint on the planet zones, adjective noun. You see, everything in there is adjective noun except for that one place. He, he's mixing up the rhythm of the sentence. It's basic and it's important because you will notice that you, you know, it's, this is one of the things that you actually do have to think about when you're writing later drafts because our brains get into a groove and it's the most comfortable thing in the world to put an adjective in front of a noun. It's the most comfortable thing in the world just to keep writing in the same rhythm over and over and over again. So this is one of the things where you actually have to kick yourself out of the rhythm by doing something as simple as just changing the noun and adding the adjectives after the noun instead of in front of them. Okay? So, but you're also going to get more detail, more information, fuller, richer poems. The, the thing is, you can only add so many adjectives in front of a noun before the reader starts going, what in the world are you doing? Right? So, if he had, you know, if he had, if he, if he, if, if we had a sentence such as I'm going to give you later, um, I was driving down the back roads to meet my friends by the lake. And if I said I was driving down the curvy, hairpinned, graveled, dangerous, how many more adjectives can I add to this? Um, deer infested, milk, in, <laughs> beside the milkweed infested ditches. Wait, it's starting to sound bad, right? It's starting to sound real bad. You can only add so many adjectives in front of a noun for things to start sounding really bad. Whereas, if you really wanted to push, you know, you really wanted to push it and just to show off your ability, you could add as many adjectives after the noun as you want to. And you'd still be writing a grammatically correct sentence, and you could call yourself Faulkner, and you'd be very proud of yourself. Okay? Um, that was a joke. Um, <laughs> don't call yourself Faulkner. But it, it also, but it really does something to the rhythm, it, but it gives more detail. So, for example, the poem about Pisgah. When he, when he begins, it was the middle of the night, and I had lived a long time with that country. He can stop right there and go into the, the next, it was the middle of the night, so far into the fields, the deer began not to notice the moons and the bean row puddles. But then we do not have an image of that country. He layers that country. It was the middle of the night and I had lived so, I had lived so long, a long time with that country, with the hay rakes and rock paths and bean bridge across the snake thick waters. So now we have an idea of what that country looks like, okay? So, you, um, he only has 138 words in that poem, right? So he chose his details very carefully. That's really 138 words. I, have, I write sentences that are longer than that. Um, so, so he, but he gave us a good idea of the tone and setting by doing that. Okay, so I, I don't know if James Kimball knows the term a positive or that, but I do know that he's quite good at doing it because he's quite good at changing up the rhythm in his sentences. He has a very good ear. But again, you know, it's also detailed. So for example, Bruce Wagel in Burning Shit at An Khe, he was a, a soldier in Vietnam, writes, um, Burning Shit, there's a title, you know what you're doing, you're burning shit. He described homemade toilets at the base camp, right? So he and another soldier had to clean by burning the shit. So, another soldier and I lifted the shelter off its blocks to expose the homemade toilets. Now, he could stop right there and then start talking about how he had, uh, he had tried trading off beer to get out of it. He had tried buying so one of the uh, local Vietnamese to do it for him. He was like, you know, please, I'll give you money, I'll give you beer, I'll give you anything. Please don't make me get down in this toilet and burn shit. Uh, okay? 
but instead he goes on to describe exactly what these homemade toilets look like. Because we don't know what homemade toilets look like, do we? Especially in Vietnam, none of us have been there. So he's drawing a picture for us. So another soldier and I lifted the shelter off its blocks to expose the homemade toilets. 55 gallon drums cut in half with crude wood seats that splintered. See how much more detail that is? How much more information he's given you just like that? And he's also given us alliteration. That's the other thing I love about appositives, because in order to get alliteration and accidents, you have to use words. You have to add words. You're adding detail, but you're choosing your words carefully. So more than likely, you know, what, what stories I've read um, from stories and nonfiction I've read from war, they're usually 100 gallon, 100 gallon um, drums. So he has a 55 gallon drum as opposed to a 100 gallon drum, as opposed to a 60 gallon drum, which is what I have to catch water in, right? So I think that he may have just made that up for the alliteration, 55 gallon drum. S sounds great, right? 55, also that's, we are talking about an unconscious effect of sounds, 55 is a fricative, so you're slowed down, you're forced to see that. You're forced to stop and think about these crude wooden benches that splintered, and you're forced to think about that and feel that, especially with the 50 splintered, so you got the assonance, and you got the um, alliteration of the F sound, so you got that, you know, the thing about adding a positives is you end up with assonance and alliteration. Okay, so, you know, if I wanted to tell you about my house that I built in the woods, right? I could say, I built a house in the woods. What are you picturing right now? Are you picturing, well, I hope you're not picturing a castle, but seriously, I could have used, I mean, there's so many different ways to build a house, right? There's stone houses, there's to go to the store and buy some, some uh, two by fours and some plywood, there's um, yurts, there's teepees, there's uh, what I did do, which is cordwood house, and then I'd have to tell you what a cordwood house is because most of you probably don't know. So I built a house in the woods, comma, the Shawnee National Forest. So now you see the woods a little bit better, right? Because before it was just random woods. Um, two acres of privately owned land, two acres of privately owned land surrounded by the Shawnee National Forest. I'm writing this poem as I go, so I'm revising as I comma. So, and then uh, cordwood, and then I have to layer cordwood and tell you what that is, right? So it's um, basically firewood that's stacked with the butt ends facing out. So it's a little log cabin, but not heavy wood. Uh, and I'd have to figure out how to write that. But the thing is, you're getting more and more detail, okay? And people use this not only in poetry, which is the only examples I've given you so far, but also in nonfiction, in fiction, in, in the really good newspaper articles you read, by like the Pulitzer Prize winning newspaper articles, if you start looking for this, you'll see it. So from this book, The World Without Us, which is a non-fiction book, the uh, premise of this non-fiction book is that, you know, humans are suddenly just sucked up in a vacuum cleaner, by a vacuum cleaner, basically just suddenly disappear. What would happen? The world without us, what would happen? But it goes back into history. So it talks about in America, and it's 10,000 years ago, an explosion of extinctions had occurred. Among the missing were a legion of Animal Kingdom Goliaths. Okay, so what's an Animal Kingdom Goliath? Instead of saying, among the missing were giant armadillos and even bigger glyptodots of Goliaths. That doesn't even sound good. That doesn't even make sense, really, grammatically. But Animal Kingdom Goliaths layered giant armadillos and the even bigger glyptodots. What in the world is a glyptodot? So he layers glyptodots resembling armor-plated Volkswagens with tails that ended in spiked maces. So this is what used to be roaming around in this country. Okay, <laughs> so, um, but the thing is, we now know this with the detail, but it sounds good because he layered, because he used a positive, it sounds good, it's rhythmically beautiful, and it's more detail, more information, all right? And then here's another example. I, I actually had, I cut out most of them, but I had about, 20 examples from this one book, from just over and over again. Okay, so if you start noticing this in the novels you read, start noticing this in the nonfiction you read. Okay, uh, the special attractions here, the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum, include a white rhino. Okay, more information about the white rhino. 
one of 600 animals shot by Teddy Roosevelt during the 1909 African safari. Wow, Teddy. Um, the special attractions here include one of the 600 animals shot by Teddy Roosevelt during a 1909 African safari, comma, a white rhino. It just does not sound as good, right? A white rhino, comma, one of the 600 animals just sounds good. Um, the rotting tissues of hippo carcasses reveal the secret to perfect bouquets, DDT, and 40 times more toxic, dildren. Pesticides banned in countries whose markets have made Kenya the world's number one rose exporter. So this last part that's in italics is layering DDT and dildren. Do you know what DDT is? Mm -hmm. Do you know what dildren is? No. Right, neither did I. <laughs> but now I know. I know it's 40 times more toxic than DDT, and I know that it's something they use to grow, to grow plants. And I know that it's used in Kenya, and apparently it's killing... Uh, is Valentine's Day over? It is, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay. Don't give each other flowers, okay? Unless they're local. Right. So this book is an excellent uh, non-fiction book, by the way. I highly recommend it, and it's full of layering, okay? So another poet, Davis McCombs, another extraordinary poet with a beautiful ear for rhythm, okay? And again, I don't know if they know this term of positive, but I do know that he has this wonderful ear for rhythm. All right, so and you look through his books. This is from his second book, uh, Dismal Rock, and it, it abounds with examples of the positives. So, that night he camped alone among kudzu and yucca, pitched the flickering egg of his tent on a shelf of sandstone above the flood plain, above sinkholes and bottomland. That's a beautiful image, right? And I'm very jealous of flickering egg of his tent. I really wish I had come up with that, that soon. Okay, so now he could have stopped right there. He didn't need to tell us anything else, we see that. But he wants us to see it more, more and more details. Because the more details you give the reader, the this better film. There's more they can see. And you are eliciting emotion from the reader by using details. The same way John Steinbeck even elicited emotion from us by using the details of the little kids with their mouths open and their bodies rigid. Okay, and their eyes wide staring at the candy. So there, where the laurels mesh into a railing and where the lights of Munfordville smudge the tree line to the west. All right, he could have stopped. He can't. He could have stopped it. He capped alone. That night, he capped alone. Period. Would that have been as good? I mean, you would miss out on so much. You would get he capped alone, but you wouldn't get you know just how gorgeous it is. And you wouldn't have gotten his love of the language, you wouldn't have gotten the rhythm, you wouldn't have gotten an appreciation of what that landscape looks like, you wouldn't have gotten that he's on, he's on a flickering egg of a tent looking down on the town of Munfordville, you wouldn't have gotten any of that. Uh, later in the same poem, he writes, he sat on a stump by the fire while the ridge below him, that long stone ship floated on shadow. So here he's layered the ridge below him and used a metaphor to layer the ridge below him. That long stone ship. So that's impressive. Okay? But now you have a wonderful idea of you know what it is below. You could stop. He said I'll stop by the fire. That's it. That's that's a sentence, right? And you can see a person sitting on a stump by the fire, but you won't get to see the ridge below him. You want to see that beautiful metaphor. The thing you remember is that if you're writing, it's probably because you love the language, at least partially. And if people are reading, they also love the language. And they want to be dazzled by the acro acrobatics of a great writer. It's so much better than videos of cats in shark suits, on roombas, chasing ducks. That gets old after a while. Okay? Now, here I have um, a sentence from an undergraduate poem, Amanda Evans, it was a very good poem, and it's about her high school friend who was killed in an automobile accident. Okay, so I just pulled this sentence out. Leaving early to drive down the back roads and ending up by the lake, we met our friends from high school. Okay? And let's talk about how we can make that sentence, how we can do something with that sentence to make it longer, more detailed, more full of information, okay? So, leaving early, we, okay guys, leaving early, 
start with that. Leaving early. What is early? 5.15 a.m. Before the sun sets. Okay, now see, do you hear that? Okay, did you hear what just happened there? Before the sun sets, 5.15 a.m. If you don't tell us what early is, you're going to have two completely different ideas from the reader of what early is. You want to tell the reader what early is. Is it early as in before the sun sets, or early as in 5.15 a.m.? So anybody else want to give me some guesses of what early is? You, let's, say, let's say we try doing it like, you know, poetically. It's 2.30 in the afternoon right now. Uh, 2 p.m. is what time this class starts. That's a little, bit, a little early for my taste. Um, but my boss, he doesn't care, right? My, if I had my way, I'd, I would write from 12 midnight to 6 a.m., go to bed at 6 a.m., get up at 12 noon, and drag in here about, I don't know, 4 o'clock, maybe? <laughs> maybe 5 o'clock. And even then, I'd be like, oh, God, people, can't my book have this? You know, I wake up about 6 p.m., so. Uh, if, we, if we had this class at 6 p.m., that'd be awesome, <laughs> right? So, you know, I'm going to go with the before sunset for early, all right? So leaving early, what are some other ways we can say before, before, um, before dinner, even? Before the sunset, before, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. You could say beating the sun to the horizon, or beating something along those lines, like beating it's beating the s or racing the sun towards the horizon if they were taking a car. Yes, they're driving. They are driving. Uh, racing the sun to the western horizon. Mm. Eh, we're riding this. We can always revise it later if you don't like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but here's the thing about leaving. Here's the thing about a positive. Leaving early before the sun set. Before. Dinner, comma, grabbing a apple, and what, what kind of food does your mother and father have lying around the house that you can grab as you're running out the door? Bananas. Bananas. So grabbing an apple and a banana? Oranges. Oranges. <laughs> Fruitarians all of a sudden. I like it. <laughs> um, is that good, everybody? Grabbing, grabbing, grabbing a, a banana from the bowl of fruit sitting on the kitchen table, kitchen counter. Kitchen counter, because that has two hard C sounds. So grabbing a banana. You know what? Grabbing an apple. Why am I grabbing an apple instead of a banana? Because mom has an apple tree in the backyard. Yeah, well, yes, <laughs> that is correct. That would be much more ecologically sound because everyone lives within five miles of an apple tree, whereas the banana trees are all like a long way from here and started banana republic wars. Why else, poetically speaking, am I grabbing an apple instead of a banana? A sound. Thank you. Short A sounds. Grabbing, short A sounds. Grabbing an apple from the bowl on the kitchen counter, from the bowl mom kept on the kitchen counter. Okay, so you see what I've done here though? Leaving early, before the sun sets, grabbing an apple from the bowl mama kept on the kitchen counter, racing the sun to the western horizon. See how much more information you have there? That's what apologists will let you do, because you could never have put all that in front of early. I mean, you could have, but it wouldn't have sounded good. Right? Now, you can still, you can still stick an adjective here if you want to, but this is pretty good. So now we know what early is, according to my definition of early anyway, and to some of you's definition of early. So this poem already is better. It also is longer, a longer sentence, um, a more detailed sentence, because there's something I've noticed is how difficult it is to write a beautiful sounding, rhythmically beautiful sounding, grammatically correct long sentence. And this is one way to immediately expand your sentences because you want to have a mix of sentences of long, short, medium length sentences. Tell me, what is a long sentence? A word count, what would you say was a long sentence? Does everybody want to vote for 15 plus? 25. 25? 70. 70. We got 70 in the back corner. What about 80? Do I hear 80? 85. 100. 100 over here. Anybody? Higher, higher. 115. 137 in the front. 
<laughs> Sold! <laughs> you guys could have saved some money and stopped at 50. <laughs> <I'll be happy. laughs> Let's go with 50, okay? 50. 50. A long sentence. It's about 50 words or more. Okay? You can actually write a one, you, I wrote a, a verb form, I forgot, it's about 20 or, 30, 20 or so lines and it's one sentence. So it's about 100 or more words. It's one sentence. I used a cumulative sentence to do it. Okay, so to do this, you know, you would have to, like, you wouldn't want to write a poem that's nothing but 50 plus sentences. Well, I mean, if you're Faulkner or Cormac McCarthy, you might do it. But since we're neither one of those two gentlemen, we will just go ahead and mix up our sentences. Remember, um, Remember Winter Sundays by Robert Hayden, how he had that long four and a half line sentence and then no one ever thanked him. A five word sentence, and that's just gorgeous rhythm automatically. This is such an easy way to get gorgeous rhythm in your short stories and in your poetry. Okay, so leaving early, got, we're working with the sentence length already, to drive down the back road. Okay, what's a back road? Just pretend that word is back roads. <laughs> it's usually a beaten down road that used to be the main path. Oh, so it's a beaten down road that used to Well, I guess it doesn't always have to be that. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's usually beaten down at least. All right. Unmarked country road with farmhouses scattered along. Loose gravel. Also, no defining paint lines in the middle. Ah, I like that. Correct. Probably some roadkill on the side. Houses scattered along the side of the road like loose gravel. Oh, nice, Emily. <laughs> oh, everybody snack for Zach? Okay. <laughs> okay, keeping in mind, uh, the loose gravel is a nice move because remember that Amanda's friend in this poem, after we get through this sentence, she gets killed. A single car accident. We don't know how she got killed. but. Do we want to foreshadow a little bit with some danger in this back road? Okay, so uh, it's nighttime. It's we're racing. We're racing. Uh huh. We shouldn't be driving this fast. The uh, sun to the western horizon, so it's getting dark. And oh yeah, I hope she's not going west, cause boy, is it hard to drive west when the sun is setting. Okay, so she cannot see because that sun's in her eyes. It's roadkill. There's roadkill is nice. Loose because you know something is already killed. Loose gravel, because maybe she skidded on loose gravel. Uh, narrow roads, hairpin roads, those things are dangerous. Like where you're driving along and all of a sudden it's like that on the road. Uh, you have to slam on brakes to keep from going off into the fields. Fields, okay. Um, what else do you, when you're driving back roads, what else do you see? Okay, um, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you, but in, in you ready? Everybody, let's place ourselves. We're in Illinois. We're in southern Illinois. So what do you see on back roads of southern Illinois? Deer's eyes glinting in the trees. Cornfields. Um, swans and bear cornfields. Okay, cornfields. I don't think those are swans. Big fat According possum. According to my grandpa, yeah. we've seen quite a few swans out in the cornfield. Say crane or heron. Okay, let's go with heron, because I know we have herons. Uh, land goals. We got land goals. And, and I've been seeing a lot of seagulls lately. What's going on with that? We got land goals. Okay, so land goals. <laughs> Is that what your grandpa calls them? No, that's just what my friend calls them. Oh, okay. So land goals, because they are quite a ways from the sea. Uh, loose gravel, deer's eyes glinting. Those, you know, the deer's eyes, now those are dangerous, right? How many, does anybody know what the statistic is for how many vehicle deer crashes there are a year in the United States of America? A lot. Thousands, I know it's thousands, like you know, 40,000, more than that. It's a lot. I mean, you always see dead deer beside the road. You know somebody hit that deer, right? So deer's eyes glinting. We haven't actually set the time yet in this poem, but it would be a little bit more dangerous if the corn was not stubbled, so not now, not winter time because you can see the deer. Whereas if the corn is tall, you've got a wall of corn. I mean, it's thick, right? You can barely see, you can't really see. And so the deer or his eyes are glinting from the corn and they could, just like when they're in the trees, they could sneak out in front of you without you seeing them. Also, that's when you have the tall cornfields, you know, like sometimes they block your vision. 
uh, like at the stop signs and whatnot. Okay, so we made a list of what all we have in this back roads. Um, how many of you? I've actually I usually have students from like um, Chicago area who say back roads are those roads over there on the beside that building, the communications building, because they don't have the center lines and they're kind of narrow. <laughs> well, I mean, if you're a person who, say, doesn't drive or hasn't really driven outside the cities, you know, back roads, you, you get that back roads, you don't know what a back road is, is my point. So it is our job as the poet to tell the reader what the back road looks like. Some of the other things you see around here that would imply danger would be the stop signs that have the holes in them from somebody shooting them. Okay. Uh, mailboxes that have been battered. Either, either somebody has ran over them or somebody has taken a baseball bat to them. Um, beer bottles, broken beer bottles. I like broken beer bottles, do you know why? Broken B -B. beer bottles. <laughs> B, B, B. Hard, hard sounds. Broken beer bottles glinting from the ditches. Glinting from the ditches. I like glinting from the ditches because of the short eyes. Uh, broken and also the hard G and the hard D. Oh. All kinds of hard sounds in that. So broken beer bottles glinting from the ditches. So we have all these information about the back roads now. Okay, we haven't actually made a poem out of it yet. We've just uh, written it down details, but that's the point now. We know what a back road looks like, and we can start adding that. So leaving early, before the sunset. Okay, leaving early before the sunset, grabbing an apple from the bowl on the kitchen counter racing the sun to the western horizon to drive down the back roads. Hmm. That's a bit heavy. Uh, with their hairpin curves between milkweed infested ditches littered with beer cans and busted bottles and shotgun slugs. Uh, milkweed infested ditches. I like that because of the short eyes, but I would change that in my in a final draft because milkweed, everybody know what milkweed is? It's a plant that the monarch butterfly depends on, so it's a good plant. So I don't want to I don't want to imply that it's infesting the ditches, because infesting is negative. I like infesting negative, so I need to look through my field guide and find a plant with a short eye that grows in southern Illinois and would be in the ditches and is an invasive. That's what I need. I need something that's an invasive. So. Say it again? Russian olive. Russian olive is an invasive. <laughs> yes, it is. And it does grow everywhere. Um, I'm going to look some more, though, because I want to find something with a short eye. It's the it in sure. olive. Oh, olive, olive, olive. Yeah, I'm going to look harder, though. Because <laughs> that's sort of hidden. Olive is sort of hidden. Uh -huh. It has something to do with the stress. Olive, olive. The stress is on ah. Yeah. So we don't pay as much attention to the unstressed syllable. Uh huh. The V kind of swallows the sound. It does, because we're not stressing it. On the other hand, it is a an invasive. Mm -hmm. So so I might sort of I might you know I might that that's good, right? But I'm gonna you know, I have a field guide. I have an imaginary field guide in front of me right now and I'm flipping through it and I bet I can find something else. I know mustard, I know stinging nettle. Stinging nettle. Like stiff, which is which is a bad plan if you try to walk through it. And also the stinging, the short eye. I got that with the stinging. Uh, poison ivy. Poison ivy. Kudz, poison ivy, which is definitely a bad plant. Kudzu is coming. Have you guys seen the kudzu growing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's not the right sounds though. But <laughs> that's, there's plenty of that and it's definitely a bad plant. So I would, um, I would, you know, I would keep pushing it. Now I like that I added Ditches littered with beer cans, busted bottles, shotgun slugs, because now I've got beer cans, busted bottles, and that's Im implication of, of danger. You got now, we, not only do we have shotgun slugs, not only do we have the, the uh, stop signs that are filled with the holes from somebody shooting them, but now we've got some drunk people. No, drunk people with guns. That can be kind of scary. I live surrounded by, uh, out in the forest, I live surrounded by uh, camp, hunting camps. So first weekend of deer season, there's 40 men in one camp and you know 40 men in the other camp, and the guns are shooting off and and they're drinking because you know they're having fun and it's like oh boy, <laughs> it, it's I did I did once you know I went and visited you know because you know 
I went, I went and said hello to them as they came in, and this very, very drunk man looked at me and said, there's a woman in deer camp, and I said, I'm leaving. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Have a good hunt. Uh, okay. Um, so, leaving early, before the sun sets, grabbing an apple off the, out of the bowl Mama kept on the kitchen counter, racing the sun to the western horizon, driving down the back roads with their hairpin curves between milkweed-infested ditches littered with beer cans, busted bottles, shotgun slugs, and vast, seemingly endless cornfields in which deer with their burning eyes ghosted in and out of the fog. I like that. I like that. <laughs> I like that because now I have the cornfields and their vast, this is an accurate description, and their seemingly endless and the and there's fog now. I've added fog to our back roads. And you know how dangerous it is to drive when it's really foggy. And the deer with their burning eyes are ghosting in and out of the cornfield. So the ghost gives me some foreshadowing of Amanda's friend being killed later in the poem. Okay, and that's all with just layering. There's not a single adjective in here yet. And the also, I can still layer drive. We haven't layered this yet. We also haven't layered roads to meet her friends we haven't layered friends, and we haven't layered lake. Uh, how, does a, how does this friend drive? No, no, let me make this clear. Not how do you drive, because I know all of you drive with your hands on two and ten perfectly. Uh, but how does the friend drive? Texting on her phone, me on the wheel, not really paying attention, music blasting. Thank you. <laughs> that, that all sounded very good. Um, so music blasting. How about fiddling with the radio? Do you have radios in your cars? Yes. <laughs> How about, I mean, Bluetooth. Uh, fiddling with the radio, um, music blasting. So you could have also just died because the beer ran out and she hit the gravel. Like, oh. The blame doesn't necessarily have to be placed upon herself. I'm not blaming it on her. Oh, we're, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm blaming it on the deer. That's why they're ghosting in and out of the cornfields. Uh, actually, we don't know how she died. Yeah, I just meant, like, I thought you were specifically talking about her, but you're obviously talking about how the friends, all the people, all the teenagers drive on those roads. Right. Teenagers and quite a few adults also <laughs> drive on those roads. I just yeah. had the teenagers in reference. But, no, but Lane makes a good point. If I don't want to imply in any way whatsoever that Amanda's friend was at fault, then I would perhaps not layer drive. I would just layer the, the uh, back roads and blame it on the back roads. But because I'm doing an experiment here and I'm making a ridiculously long sentence with a lot of layering, um, I'm just layering everything just to show you that you can. Because by the time we finish with this sentence, it's going to be like 150 words long. And you're going to be like, okay, that's a little excessive, don't you think? <laughs> but it's an experiment, right? Just, see, just to show you what you can. You can layer, is that an adverb, right? Is early an adverb or is it an adjective? Okay, I almost spelled ninth grade English. Um, verb, noun, friends, late for nouns. So you can layer adjectives, adverbs, nouns, you can layer just about anything, you know, except for objects like, uh, like you can't layer the, I don't think. Um, back roads, leaving. Hmm. Okay, but fiddling with the radio, music blasting, one hand uh, steering with her knee as she put on her makeup. You ever see anybody doing that while they're driving down the road? I've done that. Yes. I sometimes <laughs> pluck my eyebrows while I drive. Uh, you? What? I sometimes pluck my eyebrows while I drive. You pluck your eyebrows while you drive. That's life. <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, you see people eating, you see people uh, plucking their eyebrows, you see people brushing their teeth, you see people you know, uh, putting on their makeup, adjusting their ties, uh, you see people looking in the back, in the back seat, yelling at their kid. Shaving. Uh, sh you see people shave for sure, you can shave while you're driving. Yeah. Um, Painting you, your nails. Uh, cutting your fingernails, yeah, paint, you know, doing the little manicuring of your fingernails. I mean, absolutely. You're running a little bit late and you got to get all that done, right? I, I used to have a, a actually was one of my graduate students, and we went somewhere like that, maybe she drove me to a reading or something, and she, she's from Mississippi, she's very polite, driving, and she was like, talking to me, blah, 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 and I was like, oh my God, will you please look at the road? She's like, but that's not polite, I have to look at you when I'm talking to you, and I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> please be impolite, I'm begging you. not polite. 
<laughs> um, but you know, people do that, right? <laughs> so we can layer that. We can layer uh, fiddling with the radio. Uh, we can also layer the lake. Because when you think of lake, here again, see this is that. You are drawing a picture for the reader, and you want to tell the reader exactly what you're thinking, for the most part. You don't want the reader to have to write your poem for you. And again, the details will help show the world in which you live and the world you're describing, and also they will help show your emotions, okay? And so it's important that you choose your details to show your emotions in this world. That's why the deer are ghosting in and out of the vast, seemingly endless cornfield in the, the curling fog. So the lake, when you say lake, you need to make sure that the reader sees the lake you're seeing. So like, you know, if I say my grandmother, you're not going to see my grandmother, you're going to see your grandmother. If I say my mother, you're going to see your mother. If I say my father, you're going to see your father. If I say my car, you're going to see your car. So it's my job to make you see what it is I want you to see. So a lake could be anything, right? It could be... The there's, campus there's, lake, the yeah. Crab Orchard Lake, it could be Lake Michigan. All right, I mean, sure, it could be Lake Michigan, or it could be Crab Orchard Lake, or Devil's Kitchen Lake, or Little Grassy Lake. It could be a lake, um, there's a lake up in the woods in the National Forest near where I live, that uh, it's just a little teeny weeny lake that's surrounded by the forest, and there's a, an old mattress and used condoms. Don't want to go there? You want a prettier lake? <laughs> okay. Do you want a, something like, you know, a lake with um, old fire pits? Do you want a lifeguard at this lake? Do you want a, um, do you want uh, seagulls? <laughs> do you want, it's, if it's nighttime now, do you want bats? Spiders. Spiders? Yeah. Spiders are everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, you like but, spiders. But like, no, I hate spiders. <laughs> but like, it's a sad poem, so like, we want negative aspects. Well, okay, well then, um, we could have like, you know, walking through the woods to get to the lake with a flashlight. And you know how when you shine your flashlight at nighttime, all the little spiders' eyes gleam up out of the grass? I mean, there's just everywhere, like every inch, there's another spider's eyes gleaming. Out, out, out. There's a lot of, for the sake of YouTube, there's a lot of really interesting expressions on people's faces right now. <laughs> there's a lot of spiders in the world. Um, I actually like it to shine. I like to see that those little eyes gleaming out of the grass. <laughs> okay, so maybe we'll have spiders. It could be a, a lake where not a lot of people go and the fences are rusty around the lake and then there's this big tree and it has all these cobwebs and all these little spiders and the kids raise their flashlights and look at the gleaming of the eyes before they go to the lake. There. <laughs> there. And is there a screech owl in this tree? Because I'm liking this tree. Is there a... An owl? An owl? What kind of owl is it that screams? Have you guys heard that owl that screams? It's terrifying. <laughs> is it a screech owl, right? Probably. You, I mean, if that thing flies over your house and screaming, it's, I mean, it's absolutely terrifying. You think somebody's being murdered. Um, and then, of course, we could have some bobcats out in the woods, because if you guys ever hear a bobcat howling, mm -hmm. sounds just like a woman screaming. Coyotes, too. Coyotes howling, fox. When fox are mating, they're terrifying. <laughs> They make terrifying noises. So we definitely could have noises because usually we do, when we write our poems and our stories, we just do sight images. So if we had noise image, that would be great. Um, one, one of my students in the past suggested that we make the lake um, pressed in the countryside like a coin. And I like that because so far we've been on the ground looking at everything. So with that pressed in the countryside like a corn, we've come up to a different viewpoint. It's as if we have a camera and we've panned out. And now we're looking at a huge overall picture instead of just a very close-up picture. So we could have, you know, we could have it littered. Uh, there's that word littered again. Um, but we, could, we could have it cratered with charred, charred wood of old bonfires. We could have um, herons coming out in the cattails. Uh, we could have, if it's nighttime, we could have the owls or bats, bats uh, floating through the black bowl of sky. We could have uh, driftwood. We, we, we could have um, 
We could have, I mean, we could have owls. I like owls. But I'm going with bats though because of the black bowl of the sky that I just added. So here, we left early, before the sun set, grabbing an apple from the bow Mama kept on the kitchen counter, racing the sun to the western horizon, driving down the back roads with their hairpin curves between milkweed infested ditches littered with beer cans, busted bottles, shotgun slugs, and vast, seemingly endless cornfields in which deer with their burning eyes ghosted in and out of the fog, ending up at the lake pressed into the countryside like a cone floating with wood on which turtles teetered. I don't like that, it sounds childish. I, I wrote it and I don't like it. I'm going to delete that later. Um, <laughs> delete key is the best friend of the writer. <laughs> Which turtles teetered as bats screeched through the black bowl of the sky where we met our high school goth friends. I gave us an adjective. Black clothed, heavily made up, slouching, bored with everything from parents to themselves. That's 94 words. Um, that's 94 words. It started out like, what, 20 words? <laughs> okay. Um, so, do you hear how much better that is, though? Okay, that's a little excessive. But especially that part where, they're, where we're driving down the back roads and we've described the back roads. You can just choose to layer one thing. We just did an experiment which we layered everything. And I didn't even, in that, that sentence that was 94 words, I didn't even add, I didn't layer the drive. But, you know, driving one knee on the steering wheel, fiddling with the radio while plucking her eyebrows, or plucking her eyebrows, <laughs> or putting on our makeup, or brushing our teeth, or, or eating the apple that we grabbed out of the bowl. Um, okay, so basically though, what we're doing here is working on rhythm. Huh? And we're working on adding detail to our poems. Okay, so another way that you can work on rhythm, and it's very easy, is to write a cumulative sentence, okay? So basically when you're writing, it's a, it's a process of addition. It's a process of thinking to yourself, what more information does the reader need? What can I add to this poem? What can I add to this short story to give more details? You know, whether you're giving details about a character, giving details about the landscape, giving details about the emotion inside the character, you're adding more details, okay? So if I wrote a very base short sentence, very base short sentence. She turned on her computer. That basically gives you no information at all, right? She turned on her computer because you know what a computer is. You know what turned on is. She turned on her computer. It's telling you pretty much nothing. It's a very simple sentence. And there are times when you want to write a simple sentence. But this is just, you know, it's a lesson on how to not write a simple sentence, how to add, how to give more detail, and how, and this is important, how to write a cumulative sentence that is grammatically correct, okay? So, what if I wrote instead, she turned on her computer, comma, a battered, dog-chewed, duct-taped red Acer she bought at a Black Friday sale five years before, watching with a deep frown on her face as it warmed up, an ominous buzzing sound coming from somewhere in its hidden, hidden interior as the Acer icon circled and circled like a sailboat with broken rigging, then clicking on link after link trying to find news of the election. That's a long sentence. Okay, now, I'm modifying the clause she turned on her computer, which I'm modifying the complete sentence she turned on her computer. Okay, but what's important is that I mostly modified with free, free modifiers. Okay, so I'm accumulating, I'm giving you more information. So here's the thing about free modifiers. You can put them anywhere in the sentence. Okay, she turned on her computer. All right, um, instead I could have stopped. I could have started with watching with a deep frown on her face. She turned on her computer watching with a deep frown her, on her face as an ominous buzzing sound from somewhere coming from somewhere in its hidden interior as the Acer icon circled and circled like a sailboat with broken rigging. She turned on her computer. Yeah, that doesn't sound good, but grammatically it's correct. <laughs> That's what, okay. The only part that I can't really say, battered dog tube duct tape, those are not free modifiers. Those are a positives that I've added, okay. But with free modifiers, you are writing a cumulative sentence, you're immediately adding rhythm, and you're making more details for your reader. 
So let's find a better example. Oh, there's that again. You have a kernel sentence, and some kernel sentences do indeed have a purpose, like, and you want to just leave them just like that. You don't want to change them. Think about this. Jesus wept. You don't want to, you don't want, I mean, Jesus wept, comma, dropping to his knees, hands to his face, sobbing as the tears dropped to the desert floor. Dropping to his knees, hand to his face, sobbing as his tears dropped to the desert floor, Jesus wept. Dropping to his knees, Jesus wept, hands to his face, tears dropping to the desert floor. You see, those are free modifiers, so they work, but are they more powerful than Jesus wept? I, I like that sentence. I like that sentence, Jesus wept, so I, I don't think it is, okay? Um, but think about something like this. George was coming down in the telemark position. This is Ernest Hemingway, who we think of as a short sentence writer. He very much writes in kernel sentences, especially when he's writing, say, for example, from the world, from the viewpoint of his um, World War I vets who have come home, like uh, Nick Adams and Harold Krebs who have come back from World War I, and they just look at the world, and they just see the world, and there's no inner reflection on the world. Uh, another example is Rambo. Uh, First Blood, I think is the name of the book those Rambo films were, were based on. And all of these sentences are just very short kernel sentences. Kernel sentences, just short basic sentences like Jesus wept. Okay? Very short sentences. But you don't want to, well, I mean, you might, maybe if you're writing a hard-boiled detective novel. But let's say you're writing a hard-boiled detective novel and you've got a hard-boiled detective. He's probably going to do kernel sentences, right? He's going to think in kernel sentences. He's going to talk in kernel sentences. But the other characters, who are bouncing off of him. Some of them probably need to think and talk in cumulative sentences. That makes a bigger contrast. So, so let's talk about then, but a cumulative sentence, the most important thing to remember is the free modifier. So this is Ernest Hemingway, who we think of as a short sentence writer, but this is 74 words. George was coming down to the telemark position, kneeling, one leg forward and bent, the other trailing, his sticks hanging like some insect's thin legs, kicking up puffs of snow, and finally the whole kneeling, trailing figure coming around in a beautiful right curve, crouching, the legs shot forward and back, the body leaning out against the swing, the sticks extending the curve like points of light, all in a wild cloud of snow. See how easily that moves? That's because they're all free modifiers. You know they're free modifiers because you can move them around. So, kneeling, one leg forward and bent, sticks axing the curve like points of light in a wild cloud of snow. George was coming down in the telemark position. One leg forward and bent, the other trailing. The sticks hanging like some insect's thin legs. Or we could start. His, his sticks hanging like some insect's thin legs, kicking up puffs of snow. George was coming down in the telemark position. Or, um, the trailing figure coming around in a beautiful right curve, crouching legs shot forward and back. George was coming down in the telemark position, kneeling, one leg forward. Uh, the body leaning out against the swing. Like points of light, the sticks actually in the curve. Any way you do it, it will work grammatically. So that's how you know they're free modifiers. These make for beautiful sentences. Bound modifiers that, can you, not, that you cannot move around as easily will make for a sentence that's a little bit more difficult to read. It's bound. It is bound, B-O-U-N-D, right? It's, it's tied up. Okay, so free modifiers. They're not complete sentences. Almost always you have to have an I-N-G in order to make it a free modifier. Anybody else want to try a different way to read that? I mean, I know there's probably a hundred different ways to do it. Probably more. I'd have to do math. <laughs> There's probably more than a hundred different ways to do it. But what, what Hemingway is doing here, though, is he's giving you the main image first, the main kernel. George was coming down in the telemark position. And then he gives you all this information later. Um, Chris Anderson, in his book, Freestyle, A Direct Approach to Writing, says, say things directly, the subject first. George was coming down in the telemark position. Then what the subject is doing, coming down in the telemark position. Then trail the modifiers, putting the modifying phrases at the end of the straightforward declarations. Adjusting the rhythm as you need to, creating texture, refining with detail. That's the important thing. You're refining with detail. You're also changing up your rhythm as you need to. So you start with George, the subject, 
what he's doing, coming down the telemark position, and then you add all this information. You don't have to do that. You can start with, in a wild cloud of snow, kneeling, coming around in a beautiful right curve, crouching, his sticks hanging like some insect's thin legs, kicking up puffs of snow. George, come down to the telemark position, and then on and on and on, right? It's a free, modifying, it's a cumulative sentence. Seventy percent of writing is cumulative sentences. So, um, basically you want to get as much information as you can into your sentence. You want to answer the questions that the reader has before they even know to ask the questions. Uh, okay? And these are really easy to write. Cumulative sentences are really easy to write. Have, ever, have any of you ever thought about this when you were writing? You just write by instinct? Thought, thought about what specifically? Like the Cumulative sentences, like your sentence, like what exactly you're writing. Because there's so many different types of sentences. Um, there's declarative, there's parallelism, there's pre predictatives, there's subordinates, there's adjectives, there's interruptives. You know, when you're writing, you're thinking about all of this. Maybe not when you're writing, but when you're rewriting. You're thinking about, you know, how to do this. For example, interruptives. I really like interruptives if we have someone who is having trouble coming to something. Like, you have someone who's like, maybe they're having a change in emotion. Their entire worldview has been destroyed. And so they're having to like interrupt themselves over and over again to get to that. So they write interruptive sentences. Uh, interruptive dialogue is also very powerful. But cumulative sentences are the easiest to write because of the free modifiers and they're the easiest way to get rhythm in your sentence. It's like you, it's like you get this engine going, like cranked up your, your car, your car is George, and you got your car moving down in the telemark position and then Boom, you just started rolling and you kept rolling and you kept rolling and you kept rolling and you kept rolling. It's a lot easier to keep rolling than it is to stop. And what happens is the rhythm gets so incredible and the reader gets so emotionally involved in the, re the rhythm that you keep driving until you go right off a cliff and then you just keep going. You're just flying. Okay? So this is just a beautiful way to add rhythm is to use cumulative sentences. And 70% of the sentences you see in published writing are cumulative. So it's something I think you know. Try to start noticing that. All right, uh, here's a, another example. William Faulkner's barn burning. His father struck him. That's your kernel sentence right there. His father struck him. With the flat of his hand on the side of the head. Hard, but without heat. Exactly as he had struck the two mules at the store. Exactly as he would strike either of them with any stick in order to kill a horse fly. His voice still without heat or anger. You could say, with the flat of his hand on the side of the head, his father struck him hard, but without heat. Or you could say, hard, but without heat, his father struck him with the flat of his hand on the side of the head. Or you could say, exactly as he had struck the two mules at the store, his father struck him with the flat of his hand. You see, it's a free, they're free modifiers, so you can just move them around as much as you want. But he did start with the main kernel sentence and then you just add it to that main kernel sentence so we're doing just what we're talking about with the positives we're adding we're layering we're giving you more information we're giving the reader more details we're making a film for the reader with this beautiful cumulative sentence so Don DeLillo some nights the wind never stops so that's your kernel sentence beginning in a clean shrill pitch that broadens and deepens to a careless and suspenseful force rattling shutters knocking things off balconies creating a pause in one's mind a waiting for the full force to hit so you could start with beginning in a clean shrill pitch that broadens and deepens to a careless and suspenseful force some nights the wind never stops or rattling shutters knocking things off balconies. Some nights the wind never stops. Or you can make them, some nights the wind never stops at the end. Beginning in a clean, shrill pitch that broadens and deepens to a careless and suspenseful force, rattling shutters, knocking things off balconies, cresting, creating a pause in one's mind, and waiting for the full force to hit. Some nights the wind never stops. See how beautiful those sentences are? It's because of the free modifiers. This is, um, politicians often talk in free modifiers. That's how we get lulled into whatever it is they're saying. But 
you're, if you ever want to be a, polit a politician speechwriter, which is a perfectly good job, this is something you need to know how to do, how to talk in free modifiers. Um, because it's the rhythm. Rhythm is what hypnotizes the reader. It's what brings the reader into your world and keeps them there. Because that's what we love. We love that rhythm. That's why we listen to music, right? It's the rhythm. Uh, you set up parallels, you repeat things, you balance sounds against sounds. Uh, it's, it's as much an unconscious choice as it is conscious, okay? So, do you know the rules of the cumulative sentence, right? You have to have three modifiers, and the modifiers are not complete sentences. They're just phrases, clauses. You start with a kernel sentence. She walked down the hall. Uh, she opened her book. She turned on the radio. He drove. He drove. Jesus wept. You start with a kernel sentence and then add to that. And everything you add is not a complete sentence, but just a modifier, and it's modifying the kernel sentence. And you'll write a cumulative sentence. I can just go on and on and on for hundreds of words. Okay? Thank you.